Hello, America. Hello, Israel. Hello, free world. This is Levin TV. I'm Mark Levin. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a special edition of Levin TV, the coup against Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I do not believe that the longest serving, and in my view, the greatest prime minister in the history of Israel has had a fair shake with the Israeli media and most of the American media, as a matter of fact. And so using our new technologies, using the platform that we have here, I intend to do my very best to explain these allegations against the Prime Minister of Israel and to explain why they are so untoward. And in doing so, and I hope you'll watch, I brought an expert with me, somebody I've known a very, very long time. Arthur Ferguson, welcome to the show. Good Thank to see you. you again. You too. Now, Arthur, your senior counsel in a major firm in the United States. Uh, you received your JD from Yale Law School. You served as a clerk to the Honorable Thomas Grease, a United States District Judge for the Southern District of New York. You also clerked for Chief Justice Warren Berger at the time. Um, and uh, you have been a prosecutor, a federal prosecutor for a period of time, as well as a civil prosecutor, as well as a defense lawyer. So you pretty much have covered the gamut when it comes to the law in the United States. But you have taken a particular interest in what's taking place in Israel. You have family in Israel. You are Jewish. I am Jewish. What takes place in Israel matters to us. That's our ancestral home as well uh, of the Jewish people. And you're looking at what's taking place with the Prime Minister of Israel. And you contacted me. This is months ago. Yes. Because, you know, I've been very outspoken in my objection to what's taking place based on my own experience as a former chief of staff to a United States Attorney General in the Reagan administration. And we've been comparing thoughts and notes, and so I thought it would be a good idea to bring you on Levin TV, and let's have this discussion so that everybody watching in Israel, in the United States, around the world can understand that this is, in our view, a coup attempt of a sitting prime minister who's now been up for election. And even the timing of the, of the announced coming charges prior to the first election, five weeks before the first election, uh, were done in a very devious way. So let's get started here. How many charges are being brought against Benjamin Netanyahu? Three charges. Three charges. And they refer to them as case file 1000, case file 2000, and case file 4,000. So let us first go through these case file charges that are being brought by an attorney general. What's the attorney general's name? The attorney general's name is Avichai Mandelblit. And um, he basically oversees a rather large bureaucracy of yes. police officers and prosecutors and others who are, like in the United States, this entrenched bureaucracy regardless of who's prime minister, regardless of who controls the Knesset, these people are always there. Yes. And he's sort of the titular head. And if he doesn't control this bureaucracy, the it, bureaucracy it, controls him. Absolutely. Is that what's taking place here? Uh, it's either that or he himself understands what's going on. I'm not sure he does. I'm not sure that being a major general in the Israeli Defense Forces equips you to handle a case of this magnitude. In fact, I don't know whether he's even read this. I am certain the initial problem that Israelis face, that the press face, faces, and that you and I face, is this, the length of this document. It is 93 pages long. 93 pages. You would have to be a lawyer involved in the case, or someone with the time, energy, and experience as a litigator to sit and read through it. Couple that with the announcement that uh, the, a, the Attorney General has 333 witnesses. The merits will never be reached by most people. It's designed to smother the Israeli populace, the voters. It's designed to smother any person in the press who wants to fairly um, uh, analyze the charges. 
It's designed to, to smother uh, the prime minister, to prevent any fair evaluation because they're hidden in this pile of, let me say it, manure. Enormous verbiage, most of it irrelevant. And I want to go into the motives of the attorney general. Let's do this first. From this. So we have these three charges. We have the three charges. Charge the reason, one. The, you reason you need to be really focused as you read this, it's about 100 pages long, is because you really do need to ferret out the facts from fiction, the yes. law from opinion. I have said this is the longest op-ed I've ever read. Yes. And it's filled with uh, chest beating, emotional language, moral preening. What, what was your take on it? Well, that's in count 4,000. We're in charge 4,000. That's the one that accuses uh, uh, the prime minister of bribery. Although there is no evidence that he ever agreed to or accepted a bribe. You have let, let, let's go through the counts. Okay, count, count 1,000. Count 1,000, the first one. Count 1,000 is a integrity charge. Um, Netanyahu failed, uh, breached the trust that was, that reposed in him as prime minister. And it alleges that he did favors for somebody who was giving him gifts of champagne and cigars. No bribery is alleged. And this count is generally ignored by the people reporting on it. But it was this count, and in reading this charge sheet, the indictment, what we'd know as indictment, and it was the preliminary one <clears throat> that's been translated into English, that caused me to reflect on the lack of integrity of the Attorney General. Because for you, this count in particular exposed the Attorney General for what he is and what he's doing. Why is that? Why? You have to know a little bit about the count. We have the gifts from one person. It was Arnon Milchan, for whom favors were allegedly done to the prime minister and his wife over a period of five years. But these are joined with alleged favors done by a separate individual. The only allegation is that this individual, James Packer, an Australian, was introduced to the prime minister by Milchan. Packer also allegedly gave champagne and cigars what the count, but received no favors, none. No allegation of favor, no allegation of finding a, 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 a subterranean or secret means of a benefit gifts to the, prime minister. to the prime minister from Milcha. Nothing. It's just a separate person. So why is he brought up? To juice the charge. To juice the charge, to commingle from a prosecutor's perspective, to aggregate the gifts so it looks like it's something bigger than it is. Yes. So it, it looks like he got more cigars and more champagne in exchange for doing favors when, in fact, he did not. Correct. And it increases it by a third. The amount alleged in fair market value to have been received by the prime minister is juiced by a third. But he never says why they're joined. They're joined in order for this attorney general to allege in paragraph 35B the amount of favors that you, meaning the prime minister, received over a five-year period is very high. He would not, the attorney general would not have included the Packer gifts, for which no favors are alleged to have been received by Packer, from the prime minister. Um, he would not have done that had he believed the Milchan favors Was were good sufficiently enough. high. Yes. That's good enough. So and, in other that, words, and that shows me. Yeah. that this attorney general is willing to act in an unethical way to prejudice the public opinion, it also tells me that he doesn't think he has enough. He has to juice count one. If he has to juice count one, he'll juice them all. It goes to his authority and to his ethics. That's the tell. You know, in poker, you have tells. If you read closely, which this was designed to prevent. Prevent. If you read closely, you find out what he's doing. He wants to hide the truth in a, in, in a mass of words and in a threatened mass, 333 witnesses. 
But if you look in there, he can't hide his lack of integrity. I want to get back to the 333 witnesses a little later. So count one you think is completely bogus, and you think the attorney general knows it's completely bogus. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had to aggregate other gifts into the gifts where he claims there were some favors done and so forth. Right. And he doesn't explain why he's joining the gifts. Because it becomes obvious why he's doing it. Right. He wants to get to the threshold that he doesn't believe he can get to. He wants it to look worse than it is. Right. And the media buy it. Yes, because they haven't. I mean, I, I looked at the coverage in uh, Haaretz and, Ro and Reuters. Jerusalem Post has been terrible. They've all been terrible. Right. They give a paragraph. They do not spend the time to look at this. Now, I want to emphasize, I've not spoken to the prime minister, and I'm not his lawyer, but I care. You're not a special pleader. You're here. Now, let's go to count two, case file 2000. What is that allegedly all about? Okay. <clears throat> this allege, alleges that Arnon Moses, who owns a newspaper and the Ynet website, which is one of two major news websites in Israel, wanted some help from the Knesset and the prime minister support in the Knesset for regulation limiting Sheldon Adelson's competition. Sheldon Adelson came into the market in two... He has two, a weekly, major weekly paper. Right. And the proposal that uh, Moses wanted was to... Um, Adelson had to cap circulation, had to charge for his papers. Essentially, he wanted um, something to prevent effective competition from Adelson, protect his own economic interest. They had a series of meetings with the prime minister. There were the early meetings, and then there were meetings starting with the fourth and the fifth, and ultimately the sixth meeting. In the fourth meeting, he proposed a bribe to the prime minister. Before the fourth meeting, the prime minister contacted his attorney, what should I do about this, and taped the meetings secretly so he could get evidence of the bribe. So... Before we go on, so the prime minister himself contacts his lawyer, gets legal advice. Yes. And apparently is told her on his own, records the meeting. Yes. At so there's which nothing, so, the so, so, so if you're going to commit an offense, <laughs> why would you record it? Correct. And why would you seek legal advice? This is counterintuitive. Yes. Go ahead. And... So he acted on legal advice and to record the meeting. And a bribe was offered. If you can offer, and we'll come to that in count 4,000, if you can offer positive press coverage in return for um, policy um, change, policy or, change or, or whatever, or legislation yes. or right. whatever. And you can't. But let's assume that it's a bribe. So let's play along with the prosecutor and say it's a bribe, when in the rest of the free world it certainly is not. Correct. All right, go ahead. Netanyahu never accepted the bribe, didn't agree to it. And we're using the language of the prosecutor. He didn't accept the press. He didn't accept what was being offered. Right. Okay. He never intended to introduce the legislation. Did he introduce legislation? No. Did the Knesset on its own act on any legislation? No. Because it was too late in was the Knesset election cycle. Was Knesset in session long enough to introduce legislation? No. So nothing happened? Nothing happened. The Attorney General says that he is liable for a breach of trust because he didn't stand up and say, stop, stop, Mr. Moses. I cannot hear any more. He wanted him to be Horatio on the bridge. Thou shalt not pass. And the Attorney General weaves this fantasy that Netanyahu didn't act that way. I mean, I wouldn't act that way if I'm trying to get evidence. If you want to get evidence on tape, you don't say, I can't accept a bribe. But isn't it really even worse than that? Number one, it's not a bribe. Under any understanding in Western civilization, since the Magna Carta and before, that wouldn't be considered a bribe. Correct. That's number one. Number two, uh, the prime minister was concerned about the discussion. He, he ch talks to his lawyer. He tapes the next meeting. Uh, number three, does absolutely nothing 
Number four, the Knesset does absolutely nothing effective to advance whatever it is that's being right. proposed. And he's charged for it. Because he didn't stand up and say, thou shalt not Is there pass. some requirement that a politician no. stand up no. and scream out the magic words that the attorney general thinks they should scream out? No. Is it likely that everybody in parliament or anybody who seeks a position in the Knesset has had a potential discussion like this with somebody in the press, even a reporter who says, look, I'll give you good treatment, but I want some favors. Like, you give me the leaks. You, what's going on in your committee? Right. Or we need information about Iran, or we need this, or we need that. Isn't that the name of the game in democracies? Yes. And this leads us to the great case file count number 4,000 which so-called legal analysts in Israel, opinion writers in Israel, journalists in Israel, and like in America, it's hard to tell one from the other these days. They said, this is the one. This is the one where they got Netanyahu. And you say, wait a minute. This is actually the weakest of the bunch. Yes, it is. And I want to, this one, count 4,000, alleges that in this case, even without any direct evidence, Netanyahu accepted a bribe. Okay? This is a quid pro quo. The quid is favorable, favorable coverage. The quo is regulatory advancement. So let's, let's just stop just for the audience again. In these two counts, 2,000 and 4,000, we basically now have the state in the form of career police officers, career prosecutors, Report to, you and I would argue, a feckless attorney general. Yes. Who's way over his head. Yes. Or is on some kind of moral crusade of some sort of his own liking. Both of these counts are an attack on freedom of speech, on the democratic process, on the ability of politicians to, to conduct themselves as politicians do, and they empower the bureaucracy. They empower the state against the elected officials. They empower the prosecutors, the police officers, who are now, if this works, if this goes through, if there's some kind of conviction here, we're going to have enormous power over future prime ministers, how they conduct themselves, members of the Knesset. There's really no limit to this, which is why in, in, in most, in all civilized societies, but Israel, we've never seen anything like this, have we? Absolutely. And there was a statement provided by a, um, a U.S. attorneys to the attorney general when he was considering whether to go ahead with the full indictment. First, he proposed this as a interim charge sheet, and then there was some argument made by the prime minister's attorneys and this group that said exactly what you did. This has never happened before where positive press coverage could be the subject of bribery. And in fact, they, they go to the, um, I think it's the Leeson report in the United Kingdom, which examined how um, uh, dealings are done and have been done by the press in return for um, a release from antitrust but how about in the restrictions. United States? And in the United States. We have William Randolph Hearst. We have William Loeb from the old Manchester Union leader. You and I would know of him. He made Edmund Muskie cry. They were press barons. They were completely in control. You did what they wanted you to do. Or you wouldn't get positive press. Or Correct. you get negative. But isn't, even before we get thoroughly into count 4,000, isn't this what reporters in Israel do every day? Yes. The so-called liberal journalists, they talk to members of the Knesset, they talk to members of the prime minister's cabinet, they're looking for leaks, they're looking for information that they can report. And in exchange, are they not assisting either directly or indirectly the other party or the other individual who has their own political agenda? I mean, how are you going to, to criminalize this activity? But that's exactly what they're talking about. The media that are celebrating this and cheering this in Israel are celebrating and cheering their own demise. Yes, be absolutely, because every time a journalist 
talks to or interviews a politician or member of the Knesset and publishes that, there is a risk that they will be prosecuted for bribery and that the Knesset member will be prosecuted for bribery. So what is this case 4000 all about? All right, this case 4000 is another bribery claim, although this time it's supposed to case 2000 is an allegation of bribery. There couldn't be in case 2000 because the prime minister refused the bribe and taped it. Which wasn't even a bribe, but go Which ahead. Which wasn't even a bribe. 4000, a complicated, it's another. What's the basics? The basis is that Shaul Elovich, who controlled completely the Walla website, one of two news websites in Israel, the other one, Ynet, wanted permits and support, particularly for a transaction that would merge two of his companies together. In return, the allegation is, he supplied favorable coverage and responded positively to requests from emissaries of the prime minister and conveyed those requests to the CEO, Yeshua, of the Walla website. Okay. And that coverage was changed. That is the essential allegation. There are quotes, extensive quotes, goes on for pages and pages, about how Elevich believed that unless he gave positive coverage, these permits wouldn't be granted and the merger wouldn't be approved, or the com combination of these different entities that he had wouldn't be approved. All right. But no evidence that the prime minister ever agreed to such a proposal, even if it could properly be criminalized. And it can't be, for reasons that you've elucidated, and which I completely agree with. It would so there's hobble no, the president. there's no evidence that the prime minister did what he's accused of. And even if there is evidence that he did what he's accused of, so what? Correct. And it... It's even worse. There is evidence in the indictment that he didn't agree to a bribe. There is evidence. Because when he was presented with a bribe proposal in count 2000, he said no, he did not agree to it. He didn't act on it. He didn't agree to it. Couldn't be done. So your, your point. And he taped it. Your point as a former criminal prosecutor, among other things, is we have absolutely no pattern here of a prime minister taking bribes at any time for anything, in any way, anywhere. Yes. In fact, the evidence is opposite. It is in exculpatory. Ex yes. In exactly the same situation. Okay. When, when an explicit quid pro quo was proffered, he didn't accept it. So basically what they've done here is they've taken routine, customized, traditional give and take with reporters, with publishers, and so forth, and have criminalized it. Yes. And even under the worst arguments that they make, they're not crimes. Correct. And we've looked at Israeli law, and we've looked at these facts. And this is the reason, now I want to swing back, that you need 333 witnesses to swamp the court, just as they have swamped the Israeli public, just as they have swamped a, by the way, a willingly hostile Netanyahu media, almost monopolistically hostile to Netanyahu, with enough cherry-picked one-liners, uh, hyper-emotional language, fortune-cookie-type statements about justice and equality and all these other things, where people say, something must be going on here. This guy must be a crook. In America, if you're in a court of law and you're a prosecutor, this case would go nowhere. I tried when I was a prosecutor. I was a federal narcotics prosecutor for about two and a half years in Baltimore. I tried to do the ethical thing. I would never have brought this case. This is an abomination. It is not only unfair, but it is unjust in the basic core sense of what the Jewish nation, both in Israel and the broader Jewish nation, finds as necessary. You know, in, in Micah, the famous quote that's around Temple Emmanuel in New York on Fifth Avenue, 
What is it that I ask of thee? To do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly in mine eyes. This does not do justice. This does not provide mercy. And there is no humility in a 93-page charging statement. There is the opposite of humility. This is at the core of Micah's famous statement. Well, let me point this out, see if you agree. Look what it's done to the body politic in Israel. Look at all the tumult it has created. Now we're potentially headed into a third election. Um, is there any doubt in your mind that this was intended by this attorney general, for whatever his reasons, I've got my own ideas, to create exactly this scenario? Yes. To prevent Netanyahu from being reelected? Yes. To, to depose him? Yes. After all these years in office? Yes. And there's really no effective check on the attorney general? No. The only check on the attorney general is the people of Israel who can look at this and actually demand that the reporters and the analysts read through this and look at what is said and analyze it with some depth. If we are the people of the book, we've been given a whole new book that is longer than most of the prophets. Um, read it, discuss it, engage with it, and I believe that you, the people of Israel, and people around the world will understand what a put-up job this is. And when you read Count 4000, Charge 4000, there is language that I find very disturbing. It reminds me of James Comey. The avenging... Former FBI director in the United States. Right. The avenging angel. God is on my side. And I wrote it down. It's very disturbing for a prosecutor to use this about the people whom he is charging with a crime. That the prime minister wanted slanting coverage that the prime minister gained an irregular foothold in Walla, that the relationship between the prime minister and Elevich was abnormal. And this was an extreme deviation, talking about the policy disputes that underlay and some of this. And he uses language, as you've pointed out to me before, egregious. Yeah. Everything's six, egregious. Six times. Six times. We have egregious Obedience, egregious acquiescence, egregious demands, egregious capitulation, then I stopped counting. Um, and I believe there were four more times. It's the and, uh, extraordinary relationship. You know what? This is such an amateur job. I mean, honestly, sitting back, I've written Supreme Court briefs. I've written appellate court briefs, motions. You've done the same thing. You've argued cases in front of the United States Supreme Court. This is Mickey Mouse stuff. This, yes. is, this is so awful and so incompetent. But they had no choice, did they? If you're going to take down the sitting prime minister, the longest serving prime minister in the history of the state of Israel, you've got to have some reasons. And if you don't, you better make it sound damn good. That's right. And smother it in words and witnesses. The idea of the 333 witnesses and a document this long, 100 page charge sheet. Is to, is is to devour is. the system. Let me ask you about right. 333 witnesses. I looked at this list. It is mind numbing. Sheldon Adelson, his wife, <laughs> the ambassador to Israel, Ron Dermer, uh, anybody Netanyahu's met with, <laughs> talked with, had a meal with, who served with Netanyahu, is this yet more of an example beyond what we've discussed of an effort to burn down the system and to try and force Netanyahu out of office, to try and humiliate him, to try and burden him so he can't do his duties facing down Iran or whatever he, he's doing in, in a given day and so forth. This strikes me, this attorney general strikes me, just speaking for myself, as more dangerous right now to the state of Israel than any of the enemies that surround the state of Israel. Yes, because he's taking away from the voters of the state of Israel the ability to choose the prime minister on the merits. He has, he has threatened a trial with 333 witnesses. What are we talking about, a six-month trial? I am going to put the prime minister, if you re-elect him, this is a message to the voters, 
If you re-elect him, we're going to go through each of the allegations in these 93 pages, and I'm going to have 333 witnesses. I will cripple him if you elect him as prime minister. I will cripple the state of Israel. Unless, maybe we read in the press, he resigns and apologizes. Right. Which Does is, that not prove the whole point? Yes. This is the one thing that the indictment... Uh, it almost sounds like the Dreyfus case to me. Yes. I know that sounds strange, but I'm starting to think that's what's going on within the state of Israel. Yes. The one thing that I took from the indictment, that Benjamin Netanyahu is brash. New. I knew that before. He's a sabra. He's brash. He irritates the establishment. Sounds like President Trump. Yes. He's brash. He irritates the establishment. So let's find a way the AG, who doesn't know his, took us from his elbow, really has gotten into the calling other people abnormal and deviants, will find a way. Let's work it out so the establishment You've had your run, let's get him out. That's the bargain. The bargain is don't elect him or resign, and then we won't cripple the Country. state of Israel. That's the quid pro quo. And then they say, there was an editorial in the Jerusalem Post, maybe just resign. I say this. That's not I, in Israel's I, interest. I say this, exactly. You resign under these circumstances, you will empower the very forces that need to be controlled, mm -hmm. just as in the United States. It is the people who are abusing the law. It is the people who are abusing the prosecutorial process who need to be controlled and contained, not their victims, not their targets. There's a reason why what this prosecutor, this attorney general is doing has never been done in any free country that I can think of because you're destroying your system. And while this blue and white party and these other parties might be very excited about what this attorney general's doing, it's only a matter of time until they're sitting in that chair. Yes. And they should be asking themselves, Gantz and Lieberman and all the rest of them, wow, if they can question this prime minister, who's been prime minister over nine years, the greatest prime minister in the history of Israel, that's just my opinion. If they can treat him this way, dig into his personal associations, dig into his political decisions, his policy decisions, accuse him of bribery and violating the public trust where there's no bribery and no violation of the public trust. And no evidence no of any evidence. pro. No you have, you have a quid, they claim, you have a quo, but no pro. Nothing that connects, even if it could be criminalized, this prime minister with any deal but the evidence in case 2000 is if a bribery were proposed, he wouldn't accept it. He would get evidence against the briber. That's the evidence we have. There is none taking him. What, what this attorney general is, in my view, if he knows what he's doing, if he's actually read this, he's like an Essene <clears throat> who were the, the ascetic sect from whom we get the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, from Qumran, who went into Qumran, had their own rule. This Mandelblit is like a modern Essene. He wants to go in the desert, eat the equivalent of hardtack, and drink brackish water. But worse, he wants everybody to join him in eating Do you think this is water. almost a religious, in a way, religious-like mission now for this man? Oh, yeah. Why else? Why else? Use the terms deviant, abnormal, egregious. Everything's egregious. He also talks, I mean, this, this man wants to reform Israel. He wants politicians to act nice, and he wants to protect the journalists. He even talks about one of the motives in paragraph 104, one of the most egregious paragraphs. He talks about, we have to, this caused harm to professional, to the professional judgment of journalists and editors because the owner told Yeshua, the CEO of Walla, this is what I want. 
we have to protect these. And then he accuses, he accuses this attorney general, whose experience was as a major general in the IDF, I'm sure he was a fine major general, Elevich shouldn't have told Yeshua to give positive coverage to Netanyahu. So in other words, let me cut to the chase. So what you're saying here is he's saying, I need to police the profession of journalism. Right, even though he was not a journalist. And, more, and moreover, let me add this. There have been leaks galore out of his operation. Yeah. Well, aren't they guilty of bribery? They're yes. leaking for yes. positive press. Why Absolutely. else are they leaking? That's right. So where's the investigation of the investigators? There right. isn't any. Because this, in Israel, that's just not going to... I just want to underscore the point. Yes. So basically, there have been well-timed leaks to help the attorney general's narrative and the position of the case. Leaks before key election dates, leaks before key court dates. There have been bribery, according to him, there's been bribery committed left and right by his own operation. That's right. And as you and I both know, the purpose of leaks are to smear your targets. And then leaks are intended to smear this prime minister in the course of an election process. I guess what amazes me, and I'll finish on this point with you, I guess what amazes me, whether in the United States or Israel, how the so-called press has really uh, damaged our republic and that democracy. That is on freedom of the press. That is, they've taken the side of one ideology or one party or another. And they launder their so-called coverage through that ideology, through that party. Now, in the case of Israel, they don't have conservative talk radio. In the case of Israel, they don't have Fox News, except what they get via satellite from the United States. And so you can see a, a monopoly of ideology. I mean, it's even worse in Israel when I'm there than it is in the United States. Here, at least, we're more robust, we're more competitive when it comes to journalism and so forth. I'm starting to think this is part of what's going on here. That is, we have a monopoly of journalism, so-called. It's basically left and hard left, with a few here and there that are kind of centrist. Uh, maybe you can get a free newspaper or something like that. But whether it's television over there, whether it's radio, whether it's websites, and so if there's any effort by Likud or the more conservative political elements over there to try and open up the system to create more competition, you're going to be slammed with bribery. And that is the objection here. Because if you attribute the concerns, and almost all of the taped conversations are with Yeshua and the Eleviches, Yeshua, the CEO, and the Eleviches, the owner and his wife, and, and the um, um, uh, issue with the CEO about the coverage, Netanyahu, the prime minister, was very concerned. There were only two major news websites. There were only a few newspapers that could give him coverage. He wanted to protect himself and get his story out. The presentation is that he was very engaged in understanding what the coverage was. We're going to have a trial on whether he was right about the bias against him. That doesn't belong in a criminal trial. This is, this is in my understanding, of what a prosecutor... A prosecutor has enormous power, Mark. I knew that when I was a prosecutor. I wanted to do the right thing and was very careful, I, I like to think, about not stepping over the line. A grand jury cannot return an indictment. Happened to me once. Fine. It's called a no All true right. bill. That's a check on me. You can have a jury find an individual innocent. That's also a check or not guilty. That's very important. I believe that the basic principles of honor and integrity were violated just by looking at the four corners of this piece. And to go back to what this is about reforming journalism, this belongs, if anywhere, in the Columbia Journalism Review. It does not belong in a criminal court. Right. This, this should not be handled there. Arthur Ferguson, I want to thank you for a special program, the coup against Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel. I want to thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. All right.